such a utilization occupation as watering the flowers is more molten duty than yours, especially at a time when intellectual pleasure awaits you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray, open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. It isn't at all becoming a language. And I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your garden is that you should have learned to improve yourself in every way. He lived particularly stressing your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always left stress stressing your German before he leaves for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he can be so serious that I do not think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity demands specially to be commended at one so the part of the young as he is. I know no one who has such a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that's why he looks a little bored when we play it together. <laughs> <laughs> Cecily! I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality will be out of place in this conversation. <coughs> you must remember this constant anxiety about that poor unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometime. We would have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I know you certainly would. You know German and geology and things of that kind influence a man very much. I do not think I can produce an effect on character. According to his own brother's admission, it's a true belief and vacillating. I don't think I have the desire to acclaim him. I am not in favour of this modern mania of turning bad people into good people at moments' notice. As a man sows or shall he reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you keep your diary at all. I keep a diary to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should forget all about them. <coughs> Memory, my dear Cecily, is a diary that we all carry back with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that never happened and couldn't have possibly have never happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three volume novels that Lizzie sends us. You must not speak as slightingly of the three volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself in early days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I heard that they're not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript was unfortunately abandoned. I could use the words in the sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasper coming up through the gardens. Dr. Chancellor, this is indeed a pleasure. Miss Prism, how are you this morning? You are trust well? Miss Prism has been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good that I shall have in a pipe with you, Dr. Chasper. Cecily, I've not mentioned anything about a headache. Oh, I know that, Miss Prism, but I felt instinctively that you had a headache, and I was thinking about that, and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you're not inattentive. Oh, I am afraid I am. Well, that is strange. If I were fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. <laughs> I, I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. I suppose Mr. Worthing has not returned yet? We do not expect until Monday afternoon. Ah, oh, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sundays in London. He's not one of those people who's so in his enjoyment. He doesn't seem to be living the extravagant life his brother seems to. Anyway, I shall not disturb Ajira and her pupil any longer. Um, I think, dear doctor, I will have a walk with you. I find I have a headache after all, and I think of walking into it good. With pleasure, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. That would be delightful. Cecily, you will continue your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the repeat you made it. It is somewhat sensational. Even these metallic problems have their Belgium sides. Horrible political 
economy. Horrid geography. Horrid, horrid chairman. Mr Ernest Worthing has driven over from the station. He brought his luggage with him. Mr Ernest Worthing, B4, The Albany, W. Uncle Jack's brother! Did you tell him Mr Worthing was in town? Yes, miss. He seemed very much disappointed. I told him that you and Miss Prism were in the gardens. He seems anxious to speak with you in private for a moment. Tell him to come out here. And you'd better talk to the housekeeper about room for him. Yes, miss. I've never met any really wicked person before. I feel rather frightened. I'm so afraid he'll look just like everyone else. He does. You are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I am not little. I'm extremely tall for my age. <laughs> but I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, Uncle Jack's brother. My cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. Oh, well, you mustn't think that I'm wicked. I I'm not really very wicked at all. If you were not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in an inexcusable manner. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Well, I have been rather reckless. I'm glad to hear it. Now that you mention it, I have been really rather bad in my own small way. I don't think you should be so proud of that, but it must have been very pleasant. It is much pleasanter being here with you. I don't understand how you are here at all. Uncle Jack will be back until Monday afternoon. <sighs> that is a great disappointment, for I am needed to go back up by the first train on Monday morning to London. I have a business appointment I'm eager to miss. Could you miss it anywhere but in London? I'm afraid it must be London. Well, I know how important it is not to keep a business engagement if one wants to retain any sense of beauty in life. But still, I think you should wait until Uncle Jack arrives. I know he won't speak to you, though you're emigrating. About my what? You're emigrating. He's gone off to buy your outfit. I wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He's got no taste in neckties at all. You won't require neckties. Uncle Jack sent you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. Well, the accounts I have heard of the next world in Australia haven't really been very encouraging. This world good enough for me, Cousin Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? That I'm afraid I am not. Which is why I want you to reform me, if you might make that your mission. I'm afraid there's no time this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you mind me reforming myself? It's rather quixotic of you, but still I think you should try. I feel better already. You look a little worse. <laughs> <laughs> that is because I'm hungry. How thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that if one's going to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Might I have a buttonhole first? I find I never have an appetite unless I have a buttonhole. A mere chandelier? No. I'd sooner... I think rose. Why? Because you and my cousin Cecily are like a pink rose. I don't think it could be right if you talk to me like that. Miss Prism never says such things to me. Then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. For you are the prettiest girl I ever saw. Miss Prism says that all of you look so snare. They are a snare. But every sensible man wishes to be caught in. I should care to catch myself as sensible man. I should know what to talk to him about. 